I would attempt it on the window boulevard a long, long time ago. I would attempt it on the window boulevard a long time ago. I'll bring the match. Do not answer you! This is it. This is the last straw. I agree with you now that this is not just the case of a few bad apples. I mean, it is a bit strange that it took you this long, but you know what? I am proud of you for finally recognizing the problem with American policing. Something has to be done. Absolutely. We, we need, need to, to reform, reform the police. Sorry, what? We need to pour more money into police sensitivity and de-escalation training, require that all alternatives to use of force be exhausted before an officer is permitted to escalate, ban chokeholds, require comprehensive reporting, and employ strict punitive measures for officers that turn off their body cams. And we should provide more incentives to officers who pursue criminal justice degrees with comprehensive racial justice modules. Did you know that LAPD officers can graduate from the academy with fewer hours of training than hairdressers in California? Yeah, I, I, I did know that actually. And they carry guns. <laughs> Remember that officer who confused her gun with her taser? The word confused is doing a lot of heavy lifting there. Regardless, if she never carried a gun to begin with, the mix up wouldn't have been possible. But until we have stricter gun laws in this country, I suppose it's not really possible for police to carry non-lethal weapons like tasers. Okay, first of all, there's no such thing as a non-lethal weapon, just less lethal weapons. If it's a weapon, you can kill someone. Still, with. maybe police should be trained to aim for the legs, or, or, uh, the hands, you know? Not shoot to kill, just, just maim. Try the cheese, it's vegan. <laughs> My house is now 100% cruelty free. <laughs> you know, for someone who loves animals as much as you do, you should really maybe re-examine your support for the police. The aggression training that canine units are subject to isn't exactly what you or I would consider humane. And thousands upon thousands of civilian pets are needlessly injured or killed by officers every year. I've seen those viral videos and I do draw the line at animal cruelty. There is no reason for an officer to shoot a dog that isn't actively biting his face off. And yet they do. Sometimes when the dog is clearly not posing any kind of a threat at all. It's like mom always says, cops are like a box of chocolates. They'll kill your dog. Oh wow, that's, that's very funny, that's cute. What Reddit board did you get that from? R slash dirtbag left. Regardless, de-escalating police interactions with pets is something that can be addressed with interdepartmental reform and training. Efforts to reform the police historically have not worked. None of them have addressed the rapid militarization of American police forces in the last half century. In fact, in many cases, funding earmarked for interdepartmental training has been used on programs like Dave Grossman's Killology Training Program, which trains officers to view all civilians as possible enemy combatants, adding to communities' atmosphere of military occupation. But isn't that just an argument in favor of more community policing? We need to have officers who are invested in the neighborhoods they patrol. Only around 20% of LAPD officers actually live in LA. If we hired more officers from the community and encouraged community policing initiatives, it stands to reason that we'd see a reduction in negative interactions with police. Like, like the Camden Police Department from your video about the police. Yeah, well, it actually turns out that Camden residents don't all consider the Camden County Police to be the success story that we thought they were. Their community policing model has been criticized by the Camden County NAACP for basically just being a new form of broken windows policing. And while the county cut their police force in half, they also ramped up video surveillance. There have also been a lot of concerns over Camden County possibly manipulating crime statistics to make it look like their police force has resulted in a reduction in crime. In truth, there has never been any correlation between policing and crime rate, so maybe it might make more sense to divest the literal billions of dollars we spend on policing in the city towards services that prevent crime, like housing, education, and mental health and addiction services. But what about serial killers? What is it with us white women and serial killers? I don't know, but it's all I think about. Me too. However, murder by serial killer is statistically unlikely and police don't actually prevent those from happening. They just investigate violent crimes after they've occurred. 
In a world without police, we'd still have departments charged with investigating crime, and perhaps they'd be staffed with investigators with more expertise in their field. You remember our friend with the PhD in forensic psychology? Yes. She knows so much about serial killers. Well, when she worked for the county, she only made about three quarters what a rookie cop makes in this city. If we abolished our traditional police force, we could afford to pay actual experts to investigate violent crimes and respond to emergencies, as well as afford services that go a long way toward preventing crimes from happening in the first place. I certainly support having more specialized and better trained law enforcement, but I think it's naive to assume that if we pour more money into communities, it's just going to magically stop crime. Not stop, but certainly reduce. Especially in cities where criminal codes disproportionately target people in poverty. We could stop arresting people experiencing homelessness or, or sending patrol vehicles to circle poorer neighborhoods and hunt down people committing nonviolent offenses like drug use or drinking outside. You know, a thing we're doing right now. That's all well and good, but there's still a statistically significant amount of violent crime in this country that isn't just going to go away overnight because you housed the unhoused and introduced more school lunch programs. Not everyone who loots a pawn shop or commits an armed robbery at a 7-Eleven is doing it because they can't afford to feed their family. Not every criminal is Jean Valjean. <clears throat> Hello? Hi, Neil Farrell, a.k.a. The Liberal Cook. Yeah, you, you don't need to say that every time you call. Yeah, so um, I've been trying to write this uh, video essay about policing, and I, I, I just, I can't stop thinking about Les Miserables. The Bubliel and Schoenberg musical first premiered in French in 1980 and subsequently in English at the Barbican in 1985, starring Colin Wilkinson, Patti LuPone, Michael Ball, Rebecca Kane, and Francis Ruffell, garnering three Olivier Awards and a Broadway production that was nominated for 12 Tonys. That's the one. No, I haven't seen it at all. I'm just reading from the script you sent me. Well, so much of the musical deals with themes of law and justice and how those two early on in the novelization of the musical. There's a novelization of the musical? By whom? I don't know, some liberal cook. Oh, I just got your name. Huh. Anyway, some liberal cook named, like, Hugo something. Anyway, there's this scene early in the novel where Jean Valjean is recently released from the chain gang and he's going from house to house looking for a place to sleep, but no one will take him in because he's basically just like a former felon. And finally he asks a prison warden to give him a cell and the warden says, commit a crime. It's literally a commentary on how the criminal justice system incentivizes recidivism. I mean, like how relevant is that to the criminal justice systems of today? And Hugo wrote it all the way back then, in 1985. Well, that's all very interesting, but what's your point? What's the problem with the video? I don't think that I can just write another video essay about defunding the police. I think there's more to it than that. The history of law enforcement is one that is often incongruous with justice. As far back as 1985, as far back as the rebellion that the musical was based on, maybe even further back than that. What we need 
is to reimagine what a just society should look like. What we need is laws and public servants that serve justice, not just the interests of power. What we need is a video essay about Les Miserables. Amanda, you're out of your mind. This video essay sounds mad. And though Brett Tube agrees that all cops are bad, I think most of us also hate Les Miserables. And the medium, they go hand in hand You don't have to agree But the LAPD has to go And Jean Valjean is the key Please Oh, little who I disagree I And what's with wrong research, with research, rhetoric, and pedagogy The cops shoot to kill And, and they do it at will We can dream of a better world we can do it through song I hope you're not wrong Go. I've, I've got to go. Okay, yeah, gonna... me too, because okay. I want to talk about Les Miserables, and I need to figure out some way that I'm going to jam it into this video essay about modern policing. All right, then. Have fun with that. I, I really do have to go. I've got no nothing in the oven. Okay, bye. Yeah, bye. Bye. Theater kid. Oh, I've got to save the world through song. Les Miserables is so good, it makes me mad. There's this sort of unspoken agreement amongst us musical theater professionals that uh, the shows that appeal to the masses, the shows that run for three decades and are translated into 20 languages and generate billions of dollars are bad, actually. They're too basic, too common. The party line is that we hate Andrew Lloyd Webber. I mean, if the lead in one of his shows breaks an ankle, any one of us could step in for them at a moment's notice and we'd be absolutely word perfect, but we hate Andrew Lloyd Webber. And you'll get a lot of purely contrarian snobs like me bending over backwards to defend the merits of Rodgers and Hammerstein's critical and commercial flop pipe dream, and in the same breath calling Dear Evan Hansen shallow petulant garbage. You kids get off my lawn! However, in my experience, even the most pompous musical theater gatekeeper when asked about Les Miserables will go, oh, yeah, Les Mis is pretty good. I mean, that wasn't always the case. Famously, the reviews for the original English language production were pretty abysmal, and the show succeeded purely through the power of word of mouth. The masses approved, and the high brow, the critics, reluctantly softened their opinions of the piece after the fact. And I think it's important to examine just why it's had such broad appeal and continues to be so enduring. I promise that this is still about criminal justice and the police. Just stay with me, stay with me. Okay, bit break. For a second, in this next section, I'm going to need to acknowledge that I know who Victor Hugo is, and it is the musical, not the novel, that is the adaptation. Here we go. The musical adaptation of Les Miserables, like its source material, resonates with such a wide, geographically and temporally disjointed audience, primarily because of the universal and humanist themes within that source material. Hugo's Les Miserables explores themes of law, justice, grace in the religious sense of that word, love and redemption. And the novel takes great pains to illustrate how the actions and lives of people matter, even and especially the most dispossessed individuals under the most oppressive system matter. This social justice bent to the novel was so potent that even the many adaptations of Hugo's earlier, much more cynical novel, Notre Dame de Paris, have included these SJW story elements. I think the musical succeeds as an adaptation, not just because it manages to condense a nearly 660,000 word novel into a streamlined two and a half hours, but because the music serves the themes of the work particularly well. The stage show is noted for its musical motifs, which are introduced and then repeated at thematically relevant story beats. This in combination with the use of the famous turntable stage in the West End Broadway and touring productions evokes something of the cyclical nature of injustice the passing of the years, and the symmetry of our past and present struggle toward a better world. The 
religious themes of the novel are much more explicit than in the musical. And in the final scene of the book, Jean Valjean dies beneath the silver candlesticks given to him by the Bishop of Digne, gazing upward toward heaven. In the stage show, this is followed by the entire cast, characters dead and alive alike, returning for a rousing reprise of the revolutionary's anthem, Do You Hear the People Sing? I know this number is just shoehorned in so that the musical can end on a big showstopper involving the whole cast, because, you know, musicals don't do quiet, elegant subtlety. But I really like the thematic pivot of the musical's ending. The refrain, will you join in our crusade, who will be strong and stand with me, somewhere beyond the barricade, is there a world you long to see, is now turned on the audience, inviting them to see themselves reflected in the story and characters and literally asking them if they can envision and fight for a better world. And yes, the answer is God, yes! Okay, big break over. The only lady I acknowledge is the musical! I think the show's power is really rooted in how accessible and familiar and relevant it all feels, maybe even more so now than ever. Like, parts of this modernized 2014 production at the Dallas Theater Center look a little clumsy. Out of angry men, it is the music of a people who will not be slaves again when the beating of but I have to admit, something about seeing this multiracial cast of young protesters who look like I could know them, and a Jean Valjean in an orange jumpsuit, really kind of makes my heart stop. It means you get your yellow ticket, please. Speaking of orange jumpsuits, in 2018, a bunch of British conservative rags like The Sun and The Daily Mail threw an absolute shit fit over a production of Les Miserables staged at HMP High Down, a Surrey prison. Because if there's anything conservatives hate more than criminals, it's arts programs. The production starred 16 inmates as well as members of the Pimlico Opera Company, a sister charity of the Grange Park Opera that has been doing prison outreach in the form of staged performances since 1989. The Sun article on the Les Mis production, which I will not link to, quotes Tory MP David Morris criticizing the event, saying, Prison should be prepared. This is just what I assume he sounds like. Prison should be preparing offenders for release back into the community by training them for proper jobs or giving them skills. Ouch, David. Why are you going to come for me like that? Aside from disagreeing on what can and cannot be defined as a proper job or skill, I also disagree with Mr. Morris's implication that performing in a production of an opera or musical doesn't prepare an inmate for their eventual release. The confidence building, cooperation, and communication skills provided by inmate arts outreach programs are worth their weight in gold. And just imagine for a minute, being incarcerated and performing Les Miserables of all pieces. Here's a work that says, you are more than the worst days of your life. Your life has value. You can change and grow, and the people who tell you that you're condemned forever because of the choices you made, they're wrong. It sends a shiver on my spine. Look at the time. I've barely written a word, and I have to go clean up. I'm having company. No. Organized police are a relatively recent development, especially in the English-speaking world. For a long time, policing was an informal communal watch system. And to be clear, it was ineffective as hell. Community watchmen were usually drunk or asleep on duty, and the watch was not considered to be noble or respectable work like policing is today. The first official American police force wasn't established until 1838, six years after the events depicted at the end of Les Miserables. A common refrain heard in America is that our modern police departments were formed from the slave patrols of the pre-Civil War era, and that's 
it, it's partially true. Many of our current departments, including departments that have spent a lot of time in the news for racialized police brutality, were formally formal slave patrols that were forced to rebrand as the Civil War gave way to Jim Crow. I'm looking at you, St. Louis. But that isn't the whole story. Uh, not all police departments were formed to target former slaves. Some of them were formed to target Native people. I kid. Well, I don't kid, they did target indigenous people. But <laughs> police departments were formalized and organized to protect the interests of capitalists in an increasingly industrialized 19th and 20th century America. In the South, this meant controlling the human beings that rich southerners kept as property. And in the North, it meant brutally enforcing vagrancy laws that forced poor people into dangerous and low-paid work and breaking up attempts by laborers to unionize. The early strikes that earned us things like our weekends, our eight-hour workdays, looked a lot more like a scene from the June Rebellion as depicted in Les Rob than anything like a modern strike. The Battle of Blair Mountain, a coal strikers uprising, is sometimes referred to as America's Second Civil War. And you can imagine which side the police fought for. Police departments were never designed to pursue justice. They were designed to enshrine the status of the powerful. I'm gonna do a little rinse, rinse, rinse. The hills are alive. With the sound of LAPD helicopters, it's just like constant. Constant. It's like a giant fucking mosquito that's always in your ear. The systems of law enforcement depicted in Les Miserables, the systems of law enforcement in 19th century France, weren't really very different. You know, they defended a rigid system of unjust laws. Uh, Javert devoting his entire life to chasing down a man who stole a loaf of bread and the National Guard slaughtering a bunch of workers and students who dared to form a Parisian autonomous zone and talk shit about the monarchy. Uh, the the new monarchy, not the not the old not the um not the empire either. Okay. Let's talk about French history for a second. Every article that I read about Les Miserables, the musical or the novelization, has some hysterical disclaimer at the top saying that it's not about the French Revolution of 1789. Everyone thinks it's about the French Revolution, but it's not! Gasp! But, you know, I think everybody knows that it's not. I mean, if you did think it was about the Revolution of 1789, no judgment. But I think the lack of guillotines in Marie Antoinette probably tipped off most of the historically ignorant. What I see people tend to confuse the events of Les Miserables with are the revolutions, rebellions, uprisings, pick your term, of 1830 and 1848. And it's not either of those either. The rebellion depicted in Les Miserables is the June Rebellion of 1832, a very short-lived and kind of insignificant uprising in a long history of uprisings. Okay, let me, let me zoom out a little bit further for a second. So the period from 1789, the end of the French Revolution, to 1914, the beginning of the First World War, has been called by some the long 19th century. The term sort of contextualizes the period of the 19th century as a period of industrialization, revolution, imperialism, and transformation of labor practices kicked off by the French Revolution in the late 18th century and extending into the early 20th century, ending with the shot that killed Franz Ferdinand and started a new era of machine warfare. It can be a really helpful way of uh, looking at modern Western history and French history, especially. You know, the, the French Revolution and the deposition of the monarchy leads to a Napoleonic empire. The fall of Napoleon leads to the reinstatement of the old Bourbon monarchy. Revolution, they shift Bourbons around a bit. Revolution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the June Rebellion is a part of this pattern of rebellions and revolutions in France's long 19th century. The previous one was in 1830, and it is often referred to as the July Monarchy, which just like confuses everything even more. But the July Monarchy replaces the less popular Bourbon King 
with a more popular liberal bourbon king. You know, things aren't really getting any better in France, poverty is skyrocketing, and to make matters worse, a recent epidemic has decimated the population, but at least the guy in charge is better than the last one. I love this song. Then in June of 1832, a radical leftist named General Lamarck, who thought that, you know, maybe human rights were a thing that should be protected, died of the cholera that was just tearing a hole right through Paris. And then a bunch of Antifa started rioting at his funeral, waving their red flags, singing their Tony award-winning songs, and throwing milkshakes into Andy No's face until the National Guard just had no choice but to come in and murder them. Were these National Guard protecting the citizens of France? Were they forces for good clashing with evil? Fuck no! They were the hired muscle for a literal fucking king, and they filled laborers and students with bullets for daring to make public speeches about how, you know, maybe people shouldn't be allowed to starve, and maybe leaders should assume positions of power based on some parameter other than the presumption of magical blood. But I digress. It's very easy for us to draw parallels between the many rebellions of the long 19th century and uprisings of the civil rights era and today. I have to admit that when I took this video of the first LA George Floyd protest last year, it took an enormous amount of restraint to not make a complete ass of myself and break into a rousing chorus of do you hear the people saying, at the end of this protest, police and National Guard were called in to arrest and shoot at activists. Nowadays, they use tear gas and rubber bullets, which are considerably less lethal than the live rounds that were used on the June rebels, but are still considered to be controversial and are banned in many countries. And now, as then, this use of force is targeted at those who pose a threat to the moneyed classes, to say nothing of those that would question the unchallenged authority of the police themselves. One study found that police were three times more likely to be violent toward left-wing protesters than right-wing. Just compare the way we were treated to the way anti-mask and anti-lockdown protesters were treated, many of them just a few miles away from here. Oh, well, that'll be our little girl boss now. Brunch besties. All right, come in. I've been thinking a lot about our conversation the other day. Me too! I can't stop thinking about it. Like, so many of the themes from Les Miserables are so relevant today. What? I mean about defunding the police. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, I, I am talking about that too. Anyway, after you went home, I put on some John Oliver and... To be honest, he said some things that really make sense. I think I could get on board with defunding the police, but all this talk about defund the police, abolish the police, it just all sounds so scary. What else is there? What else is there? What else could there be? Without cops and guns and police Are these bleeding liberal heartstrings? Are there any solid smart things To repair this racist, classist game? What else? Teams. Decriminalization of almost every non-violent crime Restorative justice instead of just serving time Serious investment in mental health services Free healthcare, social safety 
its other benefits not manifest? Is it not fucking obvious? Do I need to explain it? The countries with fewer guns have less crime. Oh my gosh, this old hat again. You're like a broken record. You progressives are so naive. How charming, how disarming, how convenient. Tell me, what do you think violence is? Violence is power, state sanctioned or not. I agree the police shouldn't have quite so much. They're scary as fuck and they should be defanged, but I'm not. Handing the city over to the gang. No, you don't understand. The LASD is the biggest gang in town. And I don't mean euphemistically, I mean they literally are a gang. With white supremacist affiliations and gang members among their ranks. I actually don't think you're making this argument in good faith at all. <laughs> Oathkeeper badges and storming the capital. If you're a victim of white supremacist violence, who do you call? I mean, the Linwood Vikings literally are a white supremacist gang of LA Sheriff's Department officers, and they're easily as murderous as the Bloods or Crips. Speaking of the Bloods and the Crips, did you know that following the Rodney King riots, they actually called a ceasefire and went to the city together requesting services for underserved neighborhoods? I'm not being naive here. We really could end a lot of gang violence by funding schools and mental health services. Wait, wait, wait a minute. What, what was that you were saying about Lane Moose? Oh, just that it has so much to say about law and justice and how those two concepts are often in opposition with one another and, and how relevant that is to our criminal justice system today. You said, um, you said not all criminals are Jean Valjean, a character whose first offense is an undoubtedly just act of misconduct, stealing bread to feed his starving nephew. Hmm. Well, his initial crime was justified, but his sentence was lengthened considerably for his numerous escape attempts. Perhaps a law that puts a man in jail for stealing a loaf of bread is unjust, but a law that puts him there for organizing a prison break, less so. But that's exactly the point. The unjust rule of law creates more crime rather than deterring it. But you know, like, Escaping from prison when the reason you're there in the first place is unjust is still kind of like a morally gray act. I would say that the crystallization of Jean Valjean, the criminal, comes when he steals the silverware from the Bishop of Vigne, who has shown him nothing but kindness. Okay. So? Valjean's parole card limits and isolates him after his release from the chain gang. You know, he, he can't get a job. He can't even find a place to stay because he's a convict. So stealing the silver becomes what he sees as his only option. The system incentivizes criminality and the escalation of crime, not any kind of restorative justice. And doesn't that remind you a little bit of our criminal justice system today? I guess. Okay, I, I am begging you to watch When They See Us. Yeah, it's on my list, just after another Schitt's Creek rewatch. When I said not every criminal is Jean Valjean, I meant not all of them are good people who will just stop committing crimes because we've funded community services and made sure that everyone's nephew has bread. Jean Valjean was a fundamentally good person at heart. He broke the law for a good reason, but then, you know, he pulled himself up by his bootstraps and became a business owner and an adopted father. If by pulled himself up by his bootstraps, you mean inherited a bunch of money from the Bishop of Dina and opened a factory with it, then yeah. I guess he did do that. But can anyone truly say that people are fundamentally good or bad? Jean Valjean only had the opportunity to become good because he was shown mercy and given resources by the Bishop of Dina. If he had carried on being chewed up and spat out by the system, he either would have ended up dead or like the Thenardiers. No, in Victor Hugo- Victor! That's his name. What? No, in Victor Hugo's novel, Hugo goes out of his way to establish the Thenardiers as wretched, 
evil people. They're bad when they have a home and own a business, and they're even worse when they're living in Paris slums. In fact, at the end of the book, Monsieur Thenardier and Gavroche and Eponine's sister, Azelma, even sail off to the Americas to work in the slave trade. Like, Jean Valjean would never stoop that low. Okay, maybe not. Maybe rock bottom Valjean would have never stooped any lower than stealing silver from churches. But notice how the book establishes how disinterested the law is in bringing people like the Thenardiers to justice. Their gang regularly robs and murders people, but they're convenient for Parisian authorities to keep around as informants. If the Thenardiers are established by the text to be evil, the law is neither interested in reforming them nor removing them from society. Meanwhile, the downtrodden in society are pursued by the law. Valjean, when he's not in hiding, and Fantine. Fantine wasn't Hugo's commentary on law. She was his commentary on society. More specifically, the way society kept women, people like you and me, in a gender caste system, kept us uneducated unless we were particularly wealthy, and shaming us for having children outside of wedlock all the while encouraging the actions of men like Cosette's father, the man who abandoned Fantine. Okay, so she is the victim of a society in which she is denied opportunity and treated more harshly by that society and by the law based on physical characteristics that she has no control over, sounds familiar. So she's debased by both unjust society and unjust law. I suppose. I mean, I guess, yeah, the law versus justice theme is kind of Javert's whole characterization. He is the unquestioning arm of the law. Absolutely loves the taste of boot polish. He believes that criminality is basically fixed and inherent and that he himself is damned because he was born two criminals in a jail. Would have loved the bell curve. And when he finally gets his opportunity to apprehend Jean Valjean in the name of the law and instead chooses mercy, he he can't handle it. And he, he, he Chris Dorners himself. The musical actually handles that bit really beautifully. After Javert releases Jean Valjean so that he can get Marius to safety, the song that he sings is the same melody as the song that Jean Valjean sings after the Bishop of Dinia shows him mercy and he decides to break his parole and become a new man. I guess that kind of means that the theme is not just of law versus justice, but that justice cannot be justice without mercy. Yes! And who in our society are more in need of mercy than those who are forced to live at its fringes? Okay, so what are you getting at here? Like, what is your point? That a primary theme for a work written about events that occurred nearly 200 years ago might be relevant today? Congratulations, Professor. That's some, that's some great A analysis you got there. Your PhD is in the mail. I'll put a bold star in it and everything. Well, you know how I love participation trophies. And what? You think that some musical theater loving liberals are gonna wake up and abolish the police because you took to your YouTube channel to say Javert is bad, actually? No. Look, I am as liberal as they come. I have only ever voted blue and I think Rose Emoji Twitter for all your faults has some really good points about our criminal justice system. I think your hearts are in the right place, but I don't think you really grasp the enormity of the task at hand. You're talking about demolishing a great deal of our nation's institutions and rebuilding them from the ground up and considerably expanding social safety nets in a nation that has been uniquely averse to welfare for at least the last 40 years. Those are things that take a lot of time and popular support and pithy phrases like abolish the police, don't build coalitions. They frighten and anger people who might otherwise be on your side if you took the time to explain what reasonable alternatives to policing They never give us the time to explain- And you know what? It is very easy for you and a bunch of other college-educated Twitter leftists to tweet out memes like, all cops are bastards, especially Paw Patrol. But the fact remains that law enforcement is one of an increasingly small pool of career paths that pay well and don't require a prohibitively expensive degree. Good 
honest people, black and brown people whose families couldn't afford to send them to college have pulled themselves up out of poverty by becoming cops. And you can call them class traitors all you want, but it is unfair of you to expect people who are less advantaged than you are to remain economically disadvantaged in service of some ideological purity test. You could replace the words cop and law enforcement with organized crime in everything you just said, and it would still ring just as true. No. Because under our current system of laws, not the fairy tale ones in your online discourse poisoned brain, one of those options is legal and above board, and the other is not. You know, you're really slipping into some bad faith arguments here, and I'm just, I'm gonna go. No, you're right. I'm sorry. Please, please stay. We can watch a Marvel or something. You guys, you like those, don't you? No, it's, it's okay. I gotta get home anyway. I've got a lot of knitting to do. I've got like 12 orders for pussy hats on my Etsy shop. I'm sympathetic to your cause, but your methods and your messaging are a mess. Alliteration. Alliteration. Nice. I hope you find what the thesis of your video is. What is my point? My point. My point is. Did you know that the character of Jean Valjean was based on a real life performed convict? Jean Francois Viroc. He actually inspired a number of famous authors, not just Victor Hugo. Arthur Conan Doyle, Edgar Allan Poe, Charles Dickens, Balzac. Like Valjean, he was a big, strong, beefy boy, and he made several escape attempts from prison, including one pretty successful one, after which he tried to establish himself as an honest merchant, but, you know, he was just constantly on the run, and eventually he went back to prison and served his time, also working as a police informant. And after his release, he formed her first private detective agency. Inspiring the character of Javert. That's right. Jean Valjean and Javert were both inspired by the same man, a problematic king. I mean, talk about the duality of man. It's, it's, it's not my point. <laughs> what is my point? Man, justice, strong boys. Did you know that the Nordic countries have been implementing what they call open prisons, where incarcerated citizens basically live in their own apartments? and they work jobs and they go to school and they're regularly released for monitored visits to see family and friends in the city. And not only have the convicted still shown genuine remorse for their crimes under this restorative model, but their recidivism rates are far, far lower than ours. Although studies have shown that more homogenized societies tend to institutionalize mercy as opposed to retribution, um, it was actually a Norwegian criminologist, Niels Christie, who concluded that the more unlike oneself the imagined perpetrator of crime, the harsher the conditions one will agree to impose upon convicted criminals, and the greater the range of acts one will agree should be designated as crimes. Which, you know, doesn't imply American politicians or voters will be voting for a more humane carceral system anytime soon. And if we did, if, if we got more humane prisons, would our system work toward restorative and rehabilitative justice or would American open prisons just be prettier cages for the hundreds of thousands of nonviolent offenders serving long sentences for things like marijuana possession? No, I'm, I mean, this is not, this is not my point either. This, that's, I'm just, I'm just very frustrated. <laughs> like, in so many ways, it seems like nothing has changed in, in 200 years. In the preface to the 10 year anniversary edition of the new Jim Crow, Michelle Alexander wrote, everything has changed and nothing 
we haven't ended or slowed the extrajudicial killings of unarmed black citizens by our police. We just have iPhones to film them on. Prison populations are less disproportionately people of color, but it's not because of more fair sentencing. It's because we've started throwing more white people in prison for having and selling the opioids that pharmaceutical companies got them addicted to. There is no one solution. The status quo is maintained by a series of interlocking systems of power that are crushing us, killing us. The repeated musical motifs and rotating stage of limbs are all evokes something of the cyclical nature of injustice and our collective inability to stop making the same mistakes we've made time and time again. And every time we make even the tiniest ounce of progress, it eventually recedes and we are back where we started. There was a time before police, before we marched and climbed the barricades. And even then, there was no peace. The powerful crushed us beneath their cavalcades. Since Amarabi, We've pursued what's just And all of our efforts Have turned to dust Like the spinning of a wheel Like the turning of the world Like the cycle of the seasons Round and round again we You may be tired It's true this fight may never end But please let me remind you Of the reason you're inspired You came to this platform With fire in your eyes It's up to every one of us There's got to be enough of us To come to this crisis fire in our hearts. It doesn't have to be perfect or perfectly thought out. It just has to be something because we need fucking change. I see it now so clearly. How could I have missed the opportunity of an issue that unites the leftists? We speak the same language. We know the same shit. All we need is our moment. And I guess this is it? And we'll say all cops are bastards And we'll sing it to the night You and me and all of Red Shoe 
the left will all unite. We'll say all folks need housing and healthcare is a right. We'll keep scraping, we'll stay hungry. We don't need to stop the fight. We'll say all cops are bastards. We won't let them grind us down. Won't be cynical or satisfied. We're gonna turn this shit around. We'll say all cops are bastards and we'll scream into the night. A better world is still in sight We'll say all cops are bastards Turn in your badges, join our fight There's no justice without mercy There's still time to make it right We don't need to know we don't need to Not everything We just need to believe again Special thanks to Verily Bitchy, Sarah Moon, Simon Brooke, and Sarah Uffler. Is that how you pronounce it? Is it Sarah Uffler? Um, <laughs> for providing their voices in the chorus. And a very special thanks to Nancy Hoopman, Jillian Bloomingdale, Jason Dunlap, Christian Weiss, Ava Caneva, Rob Ruland, Atomic Banana, David L.F., Alexander Blank, Fat Damien, Jacqueline Box, your new internet boyfriend, Sidekick, Luther Moss, Martin King, Andrew Azale Mora, Hilburn, Kareen Montagna, Cassandra O'Mara, Jason Baxter, Joseph Buckley, Kate Chappelle, and Socialist Underscore Audiophile.